أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We have a lot to cover and we're already running slightly behind in the program. لا بأس إن شاء الله تعالى. So إن شاء الله تعالى we're just moving straight in, cutting down the break a little bit and moving straight into the topic of magic and the magician. Again, bear in mind that today is primarily theory-based work. So we're not as much talking about how to perform Rukia for magic as much as we're talking about what magic actually is. So many people, in fact, I say so many Ruqa, so many Raqis don't know what magic is, let alone uh, people who do not have experience in Rukia. So it's very important that you have separate images in your mind. You understand the jinn, you understand magic, you understand the evil eye, and you understand how those three things may come together at times and intermingle, and how magic relates to the jinn, and how the jinn relates to magic, and how the jinn may relate to certain cases of the evil eye and may not do so, and how some cases of the evil eye may follow magic or magic may follow them. And so you understand the three separate issues as a, as a knowledge, as a, a piece of information, and then you understand how they join together within the cases that you will see as a practicing Rabi. Okay, we're going to begin ta'ala by looking a little bit at the history of magic. At the history of magic. And for the history of magic, we're going to begin by looking at different geographical areas and what kind of magic they used to have. And the reason is, what I'm going to mention to you now historically is not really questioned. It's well accepted amongst everyone historically. But you're going to see that many Muslims today who claim to be practicing the Sunnah or claim to be Muslim are in fact practicing the same forms of magic that were practiced by these ancient civilizations. So the first civilization that we're going to talk about is Ahlu Babil, the people of Babil. And Babil, of course, or Babylon, as it is sometimes translated, is of course a city which uh, is found within what is today Al-Iraq, today in the city of Iraq. And the people of Babylon, they had their own very specific form of magic. One of the things that the people of Babylon were particularly known for is their worship of the seven stars. So when you're making your notes, you can write down Babylon and you can write down the seven stars because you're going to need that later on when we develop how magic developed itself within Islam. So the seven uh, stars and they were known as coming close to their gods by three particular things three particular things that they would use to come near to their gods in their false worship one of them was al abkhira bukhur you know uh, what do you call them those uh, like the, the incense and and uh, the sort of uh, smelly uh, things that are burned and they, they produce a, 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 like an, a, a scented smoke so anything like this, like incense and scented smoke, they used to use this incense and this scent to come close to their gods that they worshipped, the seven stars. Of course, the nation was extremely well known for astrology, reading people's futures and so on and so forth in the stars, and through the worship of the stars and of course magic. Not only did they use smoke and uh, and uh, incense, they also used al-uqad, knots. Ancient Babylonian magic was a magic that was based upon knots, upon tying the knots and upon blowing in the knots. Tying in the knots and blowing in the knots. And naffa thati fil uqad, as Allah Azza wa Jal mentions. So keep this in mind. They were also well known for sacrificing animals to the stars. Okay? And they were well known for writing about their magic and how they practiced their magic. That's the people of Babylon, the ancient people of Babylon. Now we come to Egypt. Egypt, of course, was well known for 
It's written magic, hieroglyphics, symbols, talismans, signs. Okay, that was well known in Egyptian magic. Again, historically, it's all there. You can see it. They, were, they wrote in hieroglyphics, in symbols, in pictures. They had talismans. And this is how they performed a great amount of their uh, magic. Okay, they have, were very well known for their priesthood being magicians. The ancient Egyptian priesthood were themselves magicians. And that's well known that every senior magician would likely be a priest in the priesthood of ancient Egypt. We also know that some of the Egyptian kings, of course every king of Egypt is known as Pharaoh, Fir'aun, some of the pharaohs of Egypt themselves practiced magic. And we know that, of course, Fir'aun and what Fir'aun did with the magicians and the relationship that happened and the events that transpired around Musa and Fir'aun. And of course, this is an evidence of the kind of magic. Now, I want to make something very clear, and this is off the topic, but it's very, very, very important. Some of the brothers, Wallahu al-Musta'an, they struggle to differentiate between two completely different things. One of them is what we call sihru takhil, magic that involves, uh, it involves illusions that happen in the sight. And they struggle between differentiating between this and what we call in Arabic sha'wada. And sha'wada is illusionary magic as in card tricks and making the penny disappear behind your ear. Okay? Distinguish between the two, Ya Ikhwan. The magic that was present at the time of Musa was from the magic that was present was sihru takhil. Deceiving the eyes by using the jinn and using magic to deceive the eyes. Not that the people of Fir'aun played card tricks and they took the, the coins between their ears and they said, there you go. That wasn't what the people of Fir'aun did. And they have two different words in Arabic. But lil asaf, unfortunately, some of the tulab al-ilm and Allahul musta'an, they read some of the fatawa from the ulama and they don't know that Arabic has a different word for takhil and a different word for sha'wada. Sha'wada is magic that is not actual magic. It doesn't involve the jinn whatsoever. And it is haram. But distinguish between the two because when they say whoever does sihru takhil is a kafir, don't make a guy who took a penny from behind his ear a kafir. Distinguish between the two sihr that involves illusions and the jinn. Like we were talking about before, we were talking about, uh, what's his name, Dynamo. Qatalahullah. This shaytan, alayhi la'natullahi wal malaikati wal nasi ajma'in. Subhanallah, you can see that what he does is sihru takhil. It's not pulling a coin behind his ear. He's using the jinn and seeking closeness to the jinn to deceive the eyes. Whereas someone comes with a card trick, we say, Akhi, this is haram, make tawbah to Allah. But distinguish between the two, we call takhil, it magic with the jinn that deceives the eyes, and we call sha'wada, moving of the hand, that is quick slate of the hand that does not involve the jinn. So what was done in ancient magic of Egypt was the deceiving of the eye using the jinn and using disbelief and using coming close to the shaitan. And that's one of the forms of magic. And it was not the only form, but it's well known that that was what was done at the time of Musa. And they made the snakes, the, the sticks appear to be snakes. And we know after that what happened to them. Now we come to the ancient nation or civilization of Persia. In the ancient times, the people of Persia originally were upon Tawheed. And there came to them Rustum, who was one of the leaders of the Persians. And Rustum, one of the leaders of the Persians, again he began astrology. He began looking at the stars and determining things regarding the stars. Underlying the word stars several times because when we come down to how sihr works amongst the Muslims, you need to remember these ancient civilizations that used the stars. Because like Ibn Abbas said, they are a people who write Abajad and they look at the stars and they have nothing in the hereafter. 
I don't hold that they have anything in the hereafter. So in a moment, we're going to talk about how this relates to modern day sihr that is done today. It still relates to those ancient methodologies. And we know that uh, they had uh, various different things that they did within Persia to do with the stars and that even though the people were upon Tawheed, later on they changed and they uh, began to be famous for some of these things that we would consider astrology and fortune telling and so on and so forth. Now we come to the time of Islam and I want you to take a principle. Every single magician who knows about Islam will use the modern, the modern magic of the time of Islam rather than the ancient magic. Every magician, every magician, Christian, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, who knows the, about the existence of Islam will use Islam in their magic. Guaranteed. Yes, you may find an ancient practitioner of, practitioner of magic who just doesn't know anything about Islam, but as soon as they come to know about Islam, they will use what we call the post-Islamic magic or the magic that came, uh, came after the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. And this magic is taken from those ancient civilizations, but it is made stronger or it is made worse. I don't say stronger because the plot of the shaitan is weak, but it is made worse. It is made more disgraceful by integrating Islam into that magic. How? First of all, by letters, symbols, and talismans. Letters, symbols, and talismans. Just like they were used by the people of Egypt and some of the other nations. These talismans and symbols. But these are based now around what language? Post-Islam, around the Arabic language primarily not always but primarily around the arabic language because those magicians who heard of islam they want to use this disgraceful method of disgracing islam and disgracing the quran that's what they want to use in order to give themselves more uh, closeness to the jinn to make them uh, be able to seek nearness to the jinn in that particular way so what did they add to these symbols and these signs they added disgracing the Qur'an and every magician who has heard of Islam, every serious practitioner of magic who has heard of Islam, they disgrace the Qur'an. Even the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Christian, they know the power that they get from the jinn in disgracing the Qur'an. They disgrace the Qur'an by using the words of the Qur'an in their magic by disgracing the Qur'an as we're going to hear in a, in a moment and we're going to see some examples insha'Allah ta'ala towards the middle of this module of them disgracing the Qur'an and some videos of them disgracing the Qur'an. This magic was taken on by who? Who really took this magic on? The people of innovation. Ya Ikhwan, do not be surprised that the major figureheads of the people of innovation from the Shia from the Sufis, from all of the misguided groups, all of them without exception use magic. Without exception. From the books of the Sufiya, from the Shia, from all of the misguided groups, the heads. I'm not talking about your average Muhammad and Fatima. I'm talking about the heads, the leaders of misguidance. All of them use magic without exception from Ahlul Bid'ah. They took on this knowledge and they are the ones who are propagating this knowledge amongst the Muslim Ummah today. And this magic in many ways is much, much more dangerous and much, much more evil than the simple shirk that existed amongst the people of Quraysh before the Prophet ﷺ came to them. So this is the kind of magic which has disgracing the Quran in it, it has using the Quran, making fun of the Quran, using the, the letters of the Quran, using the letters of the Arabic language. Because the letters of the Arabic language come originally from where? From the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So they are using the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trying to disgrace it in order to make the jinn curry favor with the jinn and for the jinn to make them closer. So this gives us an introduction or a brief sort of talk about the history of magic amongst the different nations and how all of these were gathered together by modern magic which of course stemmed from benefiting from disgracing the Quran and there's no benefit in disgracing the Quran but in, in terms of the what they attempted to get from the jinn and get closer to the jinn. So now we come to linguistically what is magic. In general, sihr refers to something which is concealed from the sight. Something which is concealed and it doesn't have an obvious reason for it. You can't see the reason behind it. It's concealed from the sight and it doesn't have an obvious uh, reason behind it. That which is caused by hidden forces. Something caused by hidden forces. In modern terms of sihr, there are many, many, many definitions of magic. And like all definitions, each definition comes from a different angle. So in one time, they will say that sihr is ruqa and uqad and tama'im. It is a ruqya, words that are said, like incantations that are said, letters, words, the words that people say or uqad knots that are tied and blown on or tama'im amulets that are made and letters that are written and what do they do? they affect the body and they affect the heart and they cause the body to become ill and they can kill and they harm with the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal. But in reality, this definition in general is a definition of some of the types of magic and it's not a definition of every kind of magic. It's them trying to come close to something that, that comprises the majority of the kinds of magic. So the majority of magic is ruqa, as in ruqya meaning linguistically, not the ruqya of the Quran, but incantations like reading names and letters. Wa, 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 wa. This is what some of the magicians do. And blowing on uqad, wa wa wa, and blowing on the knots, and tamaim, amulets that they make and they write the names of the shayateen on them. So that is one description. In reality, if we want something that's kind of encompassing and easy to understand, we can say that magic is simply a contract or an agreement which exists between the magician and one or more of the jinn. And as the brother Allah reminded us and informed us about in the previous lecture, we know that the magician offers to perform certain actions and the jinn in return perform certain actions. The magician is terrified of the jinn and this is the ajab, this is the strangest thing. The jinn are terrified of the magician. You go to the jinn who the magician seeks help from and they say, oh, I'm so scared, he will hurt me, he will harm me, he's powerful. You go to the magician, he says, I'm so scared of the jinn. Look how Allah Azza wa Jal caused them to attack each other. How Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala caused them to fear each other instead of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. The jinn, they fear the magician and the magician, he fears the jinn. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. So a contract between the magician and between one or more of the jinn I'll do something for you, you'll do something for me. And I want you guys to make a note. As a principle, no magic happens without offering a, making an offering, let's say, without making an offering to the jinn. There is no magic that happens, it doesn't exist, except that it includes an offering to the jinn. I will make an offering, a sacrifice, a letter, a word, an action, a sajda, whatever it may be. It is any kind of offering that is made to the jinn and that offering in return for it, the jinn agree to do certain actions. And as the brother Hafidahullah, he said that the jinn, he, they send their foot soldiers out and they send their workers out to take part or to enforce that contract. Let us look, ya ikhwan, at magic in the light of the Qur'an. And I want you to look at five things. And these five things, I want you to take them from one ayah. And this is ayah number 102 in Surah Al-Baqarah. وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْرُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ وَعَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانِ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا 
We take this piece by piece. They followed instead what the devils recited during the reign of Sulaiman. It was not Sulaiman who disbelieved, but the shayateen disbelieved. Teaching the people magic. And what was revealed to the two angels at Babel. Harut wa Marut. وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرُ And they don't teach anyone or they didn't teach anyone until they say we are only a trial for you so do not disbelieve. We are only a trial for you so do not disbelieve. وَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ What do they learn? What do they learn from them? What do they learn? يَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُ مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرَءِ وَزَوْجِهِ They learn by that which they separate between husband and wife. وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِّينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And they cannot harm anyone except with the permission of Allah. وَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ And they learn that which harms them and it does not benefit them. And they know what? The one who bought it, he purchased this magic, he's not going to have anything in the hereafter. How evil is the thing that they sold themselves for if they only knew? Five points. Point number one magic is something that can be learnt. It is a knowledge that is learnt. You are not born like Harry Potter with a wizard wand in your hand and today I realized I was a wizard. Magic is something that you learn. You have to go out and learn it. It's an ilm. But it's an ilm that brings you nothing but evil. But it's an ilm. How do we know it's an ilm? They learn. They learn. They go and they learn this ilm. So it's not a natural born circumstance that you have the ability to practice magic. It's something you learn. Point number two. Magic is an act of disbelief. They learn what harms them and it does not benefit them. And the one who purchases it knows he's not going to have anything, anything at all in the hereafter. Every single form of magic is kufr. If it involves seeking help from the jinn, if it is standard magic, we're not talking about magic of, you know, like, oh, he's got a magical voice or he's got a magical speech. Inna min al-bayani la sihra. That from some people, when they give speeches, their, their speech is like magic. Not this magic, but real magic that we're talking about today. This magic, there is no such thing except that it is kufr. Magic causes real harm. What did they learn from them? مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ They learned that which split between husband and wife. So magic splits and it brings people together. And it causes people to love and it causes people to hate. And it kills people. And it causes people to be barren and not have children. And it causes people to do actions that they would not normally do. And it drives people to insanity. It is real. It is not like the Mu'tazila. And some of the misguided groups said that magic is just takhil. It's just imagination. It just happens to your eye. Magic kills and magic breaks up families and magic destroys people. There is no harm except with the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal, refer back to what we said about Qadr. Why would Allah give permission for harm to happen? For a wisdom that He subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to achieve from that harm. He wants to test you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to wipe out your sins. He wants to make you turn back to the Quran. He wants you to recognize your need of Him. He wants to punish those shayateen with the recitation of the Quran. He wants the truth to be shown from the falsehood and the wisdoms that we don't know of. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Hakim, is the one who is the all-wise. And the fifth point, there is no good magic. There is no white magic. There is no magic that harm, magic that heals. There is no magic that benefits. They learn that which 
harms them and it never ever ever benefits them in anything so there is no such thing as magic which benefits uh, in any way there are other things that we mentioned uh, in terms of the history we talked about Fir'aun and this of course is part of what is mentioned in the Quran about magic وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ أُتُونِي بِكُلِّ سَاحِرٍ عَلِيمٍ Fir'aun said bring me every learned magician Sahir Alim because magic is a knowledge that is learnt فَلَمَّا جَاءَ السَّحَرَةُ قَالَ لَهُمْ مُوسَىٰ أَلْقُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ مُلْقُونَ when the, the magicians came, Musa said, throw what you're going to throw. And this is from the permissible means of fighting the magicians, that you bring the people together all in one go. And what do you say? You bring the people together and you say, come on, do your magic that you're going to do. And I'm going to disgrace you in front of the people. And I'm going to give you two stories of this. And I'm not going to narrate whose stories they are because the person asked me not to narrate them. But they didn't happen to me and they didn't happen to anyone in this room. In one, a brother, he went, one of the shiuch, he went to Southeast Asia. And there was a man who was claiming to be one of the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, I'm a wali of Allah. What do we say about Ahlul Bid'ah? That they are the ones who carry the magic, the flag of magic in this ummah. He said, I am a wali from the awliya of Allah. What did he used to do? The people would come to him and he would flick his hand and they would fall over. And they would come with swords and knives and sticks and they would try to beat the wali over the head and the wali would simply stand and this person would fall down like a stone on the floor. The sheikh, he came and he said, I want to have a go. I want to take something, I'm going to have a go. They said, you can't do it. This wali, you don't have the iman. His iman is so strong and his belief in Allah Azza wa Jal is so strong, you can't touch him. But here there's a, a small child. If you can hit him, then we'll talk. So he said, do you want a sword or a knife or a stick? He said, I don't want a sword and I don't want a knife. I don't want a stick. I have my own weapon. He said, go, do it. Whatever you have, gun, knife, whatever you have with you, you do what you can. So he went up to him and he said, أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق And he fell flat down. By saying, I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the evil that he created. Blew at him, fell down in front of all the people. He said, I told you he's just a baby. Now we'll bring you, you come and see the real wali, we'll see how strong you are. And no problem. He said, line up you and all of your friends. We saw this on video. Line up you and all of your friends, one by one by one. And he went through them one by one. All of them flew down as though they had been struck by a heavy hammer. Bang! On the floor. This is Kalimatullah Tamat. The perfect words of Allah, the names and attributes of Allah, the aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that protects the person and destroys the plots of the shaitan. Another story that there was a man in Africa, and again he was, he was in Africa, and uh, there was a magician who was doing his magic. So he said, come on, let's go to him. And they gathered this magician together in, in front of all of the people when the magician was doing his magic in front of everybody, in front of all of the people. And the magician, he was doing his thing and his, you know, his levitation and his, all the things that he was doing. And then one of the brothers, one of the students, he simply took his hands to his ears and he began to recite the adhan. Flat on the floor, rolls over like he's been struck by a giant fist. Because all of the shaitan run away when they hear the other. So this is the example, following the example of Musa. So Musa said, ma antum mulqun. Put whatever you're going to put. Do whatever you're going to do. You're not going to harm me. Say, I have, Inna ma'i rabbi sayahdeen. I have my Lord with me, he will guide me. You're not going to harm me. فَلَمَّا أَلْقَوْ قَالَ مُوسَى مَا جِئْتُمْ بِهِ السِّحْرِ When they threw it, Musa said, what you have brought is magic. Inna Allah Allah Azza wa Jal will destroy it. Inna Allah la yuslihu amal al mufsidin. Allah Azza wa Jal does not allow the work of the corrupt people to be successful. Wa yuhiqu Allahu al haqqa bi kalimati. And Allah Azza wa Jal will establish the truth with His words, with His speech, with the Quran. 
ولو كره المجرمون and even if the criminals hate it and of course we have this story repeated in the Quran in different ways to give us different aspects قالوا يا موسى إما أن تلقي وإما أن نكون أول من ألقى أو موسى either you're gonna throw or we'll be the ones to throw first قال بل ألقوا he said you throw first فإذا حبالهم وعصيهم يخيل إليه من سحرهم أنها تسعى their sticks and their their staffs and their ropes they seem to move like snakes and we said they used coming close to the shaitan to do this فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً مُوسَى Musa got some fear in his heart. It might happen to you that you're in front of the shaitan one day and you get a little bit, something just comes, you jump back. قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْأَعْلَى We said do not fear, you are going to be the one that will be victorious. وَأَلْقِ مَا فِي يَمِينِكَ تَلْقَفْ مَا صَنَعُوا إِنَّمَا صَنَعُوا كَيْدُ سَاحِرُ Throw what is in your hand. In your right hand, it will eat up what they have done, will devour what they have done. What they have done is just the plot of the magician. The magician will never be successful wherever he goes. Don't look at these magicians and think that they live a happy life. They might have more money than all of us put together. They might have more status in the sight of the people. Wallahi, the shayateen punish them and punish them and punish them. They're made to live in the garbage to eat their own feces. This is the kind of situation that the magician has to do. And then he comes to the people like a wali from the awliya of Allah. And he prays in the first row of the masjid and he goes home to climb into a bath made up of animal dung. Or he goes home and he puts himself into the rubbish bin and they make him sleep for one hour or two hours and they don't let him sleep for a third. That's the situation of the magician. وَلَا يُفْلِحُ السَّاحِرُ حَيْثُ أَتَى Allah Azawajal spoke the truth that the sahir will never be content, will never be successful wherever he goes. Briefly, let us look at magic in the sunnah. It is narrated that Aisha radiallahu anha said a spell was put on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we from Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we believe and we affirm that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was bewitched with sihr. And we don't say like the Ahlul Bid'ah say, how can the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam be bewitched by sihr? Sahih al-Bukhari, from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, in Sahih Muslim, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was bewitched by a spell. Why? Not because of a weakness in Iman, not because of a lack of adhkar, to show the Ummah of Islam what to do when you're afflicted by magic. Until he imagined that he had done a thing when he had not done it. What was done to the Prophet sallallahu is called mishwa mishata. It was done with hair from his, uh, misht is a comb. And mishata is the hair that comes out from your beard or your head when you brush it with a comb. And they tied it into 11 knots. 11 knots. We're going to see a picture of Mishwa Mishata in a moment, yeah? To kill him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But they couldn't kill him. They couldn't kill him. But it caused him what? He imagined that he had done something when he had not done it. Anyone else. Illa ma rahim Allah, anyone else, they would have died from this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he just began to forget what he was doing. One day he made dua, then he said, do you know that Allah has shown me in what lies my cure? Two men came to me and one of them sat at my head and the other one at my feet. One of them said, what is ailing the man? What's he suffering from? He said, he has been bewitched. Sihr has been done to him. He said, who has bewitched him? They said, Labid ibn al-A'asam, one of the worst magicians to have ever lived. Labid ibn al-A'asam. And don't let anyone come now and say, magic is developing and magic has gone so much more better. And we have magicians now, Labid wouldn't even dream of, Labid wouldn't even be a student at their feet. We say, Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Labid ibn al-A'asam, who Allah Azza wa Jal decreed would perform sihr upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you think that the guy down the road is better than Labid ibn al-A'asam or more knowledgeable in sihr than Labid ibn al-A'asam so the Quran doesn't work for him like it worked for Labid? A'udhu Billah. Labid ibn al-A'asam. He said, with what? He said, with the comb and the hair that is stuck into it and the skin of the pollen of a male date palm. He said, where is it? They said, it is in the well of Darwan. The Prophet Sallallahu went to the well and he came back and with Aisha. And he said to Aisha when he came back, its date palms are like the heads of shayateen, like the heads of devils. Aisha said, did you not take it out, O Messenger of Allah? He said, 
Or she said in another narration, Afala ahraqtahu ya Rasulallah. Did you not burn it, O Messenger of Allah? Or did you not take it out and destroy it, O Messenger of Allah? The Prophet ﷺ said, No, Allah has healed me and I feared it might bring evil upon the people. Then the well was filled in. And this is narrated by Al-Bukhari and by Muslim. And in Sunnah Al-Tirmidhi with supporting narrations, the prescribed punishment for the magician is to be executed by the sword. So this is a brief description of magic in the Quran and the Sunnah. And now what we're going to do inshallah is to hand over to our brother Abu Ibrahim to talk a little bit about the nature of the magician. And inshallah ta'ala we're going to see some of the videos to that effect inshallah. Bismillah alhamdulillah salatu salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We want to look at the nature of the sahib now. We need to make a few things clear and set down a few very simple principles. A person cannot become a magician until they reach the highest levels of disbelief. They cannot become a, mag a magician for whom the shayateen are going to be working and they're going to be giving them assistance until they reach the highest levels of disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's rarely any return from this ya ikhwan once you have gone so far into this you know destroying the Quran desecrating the Quran disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making acts of obedience to shayateen there's rarely any way back they all they go way past the point of no return the shayateen they lure the magician with certain things. The magician, he always looks for certain things. He wants fame. So he wants to be recognized amongst the people. Or he wants wealth. So he wants to be somebody who is rich. And the shayateen, they will say, we will give you money. We will give you women. Just yesterday, myself and Muhammad were performing a ruqya session and the jinn turned to us and said, or this time turned to Muhammad the week before turned to me and said, Do you want women? I will give you women. Do you want wealth? I will give you wealth. This is the same thing that they use to lure in the magician. Whatever woman you want, you can have her. However much money you want, you can have it. However much fame you want, you will have it. So they lure them in with these promises. These fake aspirations, they lure them in and subhanAllah, it begins, it may begin as little, it may, be, may begin as something small, but it always grows into something much greater. This is another reason why we do not seek the assistance of so-called good jinn. It starts as something small, but it may lead to something greater and greater until you are doing acts of obedience to the shayateen. Once the shayateen, they have you gripped, they will not let you go. So once you do these acts for them, that's it now. You have surrendered yourself to the shayateen. You have submitted yourself to the shayateen. As our brother Hafizullah mentions, the magician, he really rarely sleeps. He may sleep one hour in a night, two hours in a night. And subhanAllah, he may have a very big beard and claim to be awliya of Allah. He's staying awake in the worship of Allah. He's not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, he is doing actions which seek to come closer to the shayateen. I want to mention now some of the acts that these magicians, they need to do in order to reach their station. The first and most, shall we say, powerful way in inverted commas for the magician to seek the aid of the shayateen and become a magician is via desecration of the Quran. Via desecration of the Quran. I want to show some videos, uh, show you a video now, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. These are copies of the mushaf which have been found in the sewers. These are copies of the Mus'haf which our Shaykh Adil Hafidhullah, he's holding them here. These have been, you know, thrown into filth. They have been rubbed into dirt. These are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, were these found in the sewers? In the sewers and they had were covered in feces. Right? Yeah, these, they found them in the sewers and they were covered in feces. These are copies of the Mus'haf 
I don't know if the sisters can also see this, but these are copies of the Mus'haf. And look at them, they have been covered in feces. And subhanAllah, the Shaykh here, Hafidhullah, may Allah preserve him, he was cleaning the feces with his own hands off the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the magician needs to do. He needs to throw these things into the sewers, rub feces on them. And this is how he comes closer to the shayateen. They will not work for him until he does something similar to this. He uses the Quran as toilet paper. A'udhu billah. He will throw the Quran into the sewer. He will take the uh, Quran and throw it into the, uh, the, the sewers and throw it into feces. This is a video now, it's not very clear, but subhanAllah, these are some sewers in Saudi Arabia and they are the brothers, may Allah preserve them. This is filth, ya ikhwan, what we see here. This is waste, human waste, etc. And they are fishing copies of the Mus'haf out of this. They are fishing copies of the Mus'haf out of the sewers. How much ghira, how much protective jealousy do you have over the words of Allah? Is it as much as what we see from this brother now? May Allah preserve him and reward him. He actually stands in this filth to extract the, uh, the, 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 the copies of the Quran from the sewers. He actually gets down, he pulls his clothes up and he gets into that and they begin to fish it out. Subhanallah. This is how the Sahir, he comes closer to the Shayateen. These are some of the things that the Sahir needs to do in order to look now. SubhanAllah, the brother is in the sewers, he's in the filth. And he is using whatever he can and he's put his whole arm in there now to fish out copies of the Quran. This is what we see. This is copies of the Mus'haf being pulled out of the sewers. And yet, Ikhwan, don't think that this only happens in the Arab countries, it also happens here as well. The magicians who are, you know, engaged in this type of thing, they are doing the exact same thing in these countries as well. It's not just something that happens in the Arab countries. These are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you can see, covered in filth, feces, defecation, etc. But this is the ghira of these brothers and sisters, that they will do their best to protect the words of Allah. This was the, what we just saw there, that was the Qur'an and it had been smeared with menstrual blood. So the menstrual blood of a woman, they took copies of the Qur'an and they smeared that upon there. Again, so they will use copies from the Qur'an. Again, this is, you can't see because of the colour, but there's menstrual blood smeared on this. There's menstrual blood, I think this is Surah Ikhlas, I'm not sure, but there's menstrual blood smeared on the copies of the Mus'haf. They will take the Mus'haf and they will place it in the soles of their shoes and they will walk on the Mus'haf. As they walk, they will. this is what they will do. They will then burn the Qur'an as we have here, they will disgrace it, they will use it as toilet paper as we have mentioned. They perform the worst types of desecration of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Ikhwan, what we saw here in this tube, this was the, the words of Allah and they used, this was placed inside of a woman when she was menstruating. So this was actually placed inside of the woman whilst she was menstruating to cover it in menstrual blood. So this is some of the desecration of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these magicians, they engage in. Subhanallah, other things that they will do. They will engage in incest. They will engage in incest. The magician, he will have to engage in incest with his own mother or his own sisters. Why are they doing this, Ya Ikhwan? Are they doing this to seek pleasure? No. They are doing this to make halal that which Allah has made haram. So the shayateen, they will make them do the most disgusting acts which everybody by necessity, when he is born, he knows that this is haram. He knows that this is haram, but he does it knowing that it is haram, knowing that it is filthy, he does it in order to come close to the shayateen. This is his way of proving, I am willing to go to any level to come close to the shayateen. Other things that we have, we also have, uh, subhanallah, they will 
They know, Ya Ikhwan, don't think that this is something that they practice and they don't know. I think perhaps later when we are going through the amulets, we might show you a section which was taken from uh, Sheikh Adil's course from the works of a magician. And there are a load of codes and subhanallah, what it says in that code once we deciphered the code was that we need to take ayats from the Quran, rub them in feces and impurities and then keep one uh, to yourself and flush the other one down the toilet. Flush pages from the Quran, rubbed with feces down the toilet. And then it said in this magician's book, fear Allah and know that this is disbelief. Why would it tell you to do these things and then say, Fear Allah and know that this is disbelief? Because the shayateen will not work for you until you know full well that what you are doing is kufr. You know full well that what you are doing, you are selling your akhirah for this measly gain. This is when the shayateen, they will begin to work for you. The more... Uh, you know, the more power that the, 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 the sahir he wants, he needs to do these acts on a more frequent basis. As our brother has mentioned, subhanallah, when they go home, you know, they might have a beautiful house, they might have wealth, whatever it might be. But subhanallah, when they go home, they go and they lie in filth. They go and they fill the bathtub up with rubbish, with feces, dead animals, dead meat. And this is how they lie. This is how they stay. Shaykh Adil Muqbil Hafizahullah, he mentions that he was called to a house in Riyadh. So in Riyadh, if there's anything dodgy going on or somebody suspects something, then they call the prince or they call the minister and then Shaykh Adil and his team, they are dispatched to investigate this address. And Shaykh Adil Hafizahullah, he mentions that he went to a house and it was dark and it was dingy in Riyadh. And the lights were off and it was dark and it was dingy. And subhanAllah, they walked into an area and there was just piles and piles of filth. And on, those, on that pile of filth, they found a man just lying there. They found a man just lying there. This is the filthy, filthy nature of the sahir. Do not be surprised if the person has a beard. As our brothers mentioned, he prays on the front row at the masjid. Don't be surprised. It's not surprising to find that they have a mushaf, they have a, co a copy of the Quran with them and inside, so on the outside looks like a mushaf and you flick through the pages, mushaf, but inside the middle few pages, this is where their magic is written. So they show the people that I am very pious. They show the people that I am from the awliya of Allah. But in actual fact, they are from the awliya of shaitan. The shayateen will also order them to make a mockery of the salah, go and pray, but don't have wudu. So they'll come and they'll pray and they won't have wudu. They know full well what they're doing. But this, they do all of this to seek nearness and closeness to the shayateen. Just going to talk you through this video. As much of it as you can see. This is a video of a magician that was caught in Riyadh. And inshallah if you can't see I wouldn't worry because we're going to superimpose these over the YouTube videos that are produced inshallah. So you'll be able to see them well. We can, we can only do the best we can because the light is clearly, there's mashallah some very big windows here. So we do the best that we can. But I'll talk you through it. In this video they caught the magician and they asked him to perform certain actions to show what he used to do. So what does he start with? He starts by burning Bukhur to, to bring the shaitan close. He starts by burning Bukhur and he wears these red clothes all these red clothes. Of course, wearing in full red is haram for a man. He wants to do something to show that it's permissible, to try and disgrace the religion of Allah Azzawajal. So he makes this bukhur and he begins to light it and he dresses himself up in these clothes and he begins to call upon the shaitan and to invite the shaitan and he mentions the names of the shaitan and he calls them to come to him. And then what does he start to do? In a second you're going to see he picks up a whip and he starts to whip himself. Can you all see him whipping himself? He starts to whip himself, repeatedly whip himself. Like who? Like the Shia. Like the Shia. He starts to whip himself. And then what does he do? He sacrifices an animal and they stopped him from doing it, but he shows in the video what he would do. This material he's got here, he sacrifices a bird, he cuts its throat and he throws it in the air so that it flaps about and the blood spills all over the room. And then 
that is nothing. What he did there, that's forget it. Now he's about to do the thing that they're going to stop him from doing. He said, and then I sleep making sajda to the shaitan. I lie down in a position of sajda to the shaitan. This is the action of a magician. And they had to stop him from doing it and say, don't do it. We don't want to see your sajda. But they just wanted him to describe and show what he used to do. This is a magician that was caught. And wallah, you know, in a moment, we're going to show you in a little while videos from Cornwall in England of English magicians. <laughs> the same actions, the same magic, the same beliefs, the same letters, the same everything. Because kufr is one religion. Kufr is one religion. And here this is what he was doing. He was making sajda to other than Allah and they stopped him from doing it. And on this curtain is spilled all of the blood from the animal he sacrificed to other than Allah. And he threw that animal up in the air. Alhamdulillah, he was probably um, beheaded shortly after. Um, okay, now let's look at the nature of the contract between the magician and the shayateen. So we've mentioned all of these things that the sahir he will do from sacrificing to, to the shayateen from desecrating the Quran from mocking Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from making halal that which Allah has made haram from incest to all these filthy actions he will do anything and everything that needs to be done in order to seek to come close to the shayateen what we then have is the contract. The contract is usually written down in the form of what? A da'wiz, in the form of an amulet. Usually the contract it is written down in the form of an amulet. But inshallah, we're going to look at some other types of magic which not, don't necessarily need to be uh, you know, written down. They may be buried, they may be burnt, they may be off a tree, whatever it might be. So the contract is usually written down and destroying this contract it's usually the easiest way to destroy the magic. If you can find the contract between the shaitan or the shayateen and the sahir and you can destroy it then bi idhnillahi ta'ala this is one of the fast track ways which is permissible or the only fast track way which is permissible to you know destroy this magic bi idhnillahi ta'ala. This contract it will use symbols, it will use charts numbers, numerology, astrology but inshallah we're going to focus on this later we're going to have the next session bi ta'ala is looking solely at amulets solely at da'weed how do we read it, what's it about how do we sort of ascertain what's going on here the contract is often protected inside of other things so the contract it may be sewn inside of clothes or it may be tied around in the neck of, of, of a person or it may be hidden subhanallah we might see a bird later on which there was a bird and the magician he had slipped the back of the bird and he had hidden this magic inside the bird the back of the bird and then he had stitched up the bird and the bird was still alive the bird was still alive but he'd hidden the magic in the back of the bird so he just slit it slowly under the skin placed it in and there we have and these are some of the examples of some of the amulets that we have showing on the screen behind us very often the contract and from the evil of those who blow into the knots so the magician he takes a piece of cloth he makes a knot he mentions you know bal 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 and then and they blow onto the knots they blow onto the knots and the Shaykh Hafizullah he actually did it he actually took the knot and he blew into it he actually made the knot and he blew into it he mentioned the names that they mentioned and he blew into it but he said this will not work because we are people of Tawheed this will only work for the person who has surrendered himself to the shayateen. This will only work for the person who has surrendered and he is seeking to come closer to the shayateen, seeking their aid, seeking their assistance through doing this. So if one of us was to do this now, you don't see any, you know, anything going on because Alhamdulillah, we are people of Tawheed. But if there was a, a mushrik sahir and this is how he would perform his magic. Now let's look at some of the purposes of magic. The purposes of the magic, they are defined by two things, by both the magician 
So for example, he is attacking someone for financial gain or as a request, you know, somebody goes and says, I want that husband and, and his wife to split up. I want him to die. I want to, uh, you know, separate him from his risk, from his income. I want him to lose his health. I want him to lose his mind. I want him to lose his family. I want him to myself. I don't want him to, you know, associate with his family, etc, etc. So this is you know, uh, one of the purposes is from the magician himself. And the second one is by the shaitan. By the shaitan. And the primary objective of the shaitan is to get people to disbelieve. Is to get people to disbelieve and to attach the hearts of the people to something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of the magician, we've mentioned he wants power and he wants status. He wants power, status, wealth, women, whatever it may be. And the shaitan, he wants people to go to the fire of Jahannam with him. So this is what they are both in it for. Now, ya ikhwan, I want to mention some symptoms of being afflicted by sihar. Some symptoms of being afflicted by sihar. But again, we put the same disclaimer on. You may have one of these symptoms or you may come across one of these symptoms this doesn't necessarily mean that the person is afflicted this doesn't necessarily mean that the person has magic or evil eye or jinn possession i'll give you an example <laughs> there's a brother sat right here with us today and he said Akhi, when i read from the mushaf i get a headache when i do ruqya and i read from the mushaf my head begins to hurt this is a brother relating to me and he's here and he'll correct me if i get it wrong and he said when i read from the mushaf i get a headache but subhanallah, when I'm reading just, you know, from memory, I'm fine. The brother had bad eyesight. When he had like one of his eyes, he needed to get his eyes checked. And so when you read from the Mus'haf, it would give him a headache. Now, if I sit here and say, when we hear the Quran, we begin to get headaches. We, you know, you might get, uh, feel very sick. Subhanallah, you feel dizzy. Somebody might think this. And does this mean that you've got magic? No. So we need to understand that there may be one or multiple of these symptoms and there is no magic or there may be other symptoms that you brothers and sisters may come across and maybe you know more than we do and subhanallah it's a sign of sihar so there are those signs which are common but then there are those signs which will be specific for each case so one of the signs is a sudden love or hatred or a sudden change in character so the husband he looks at his wife and he can't stand to be in her company they were happily married everything was absolutely fine now when he comes home subhanallah he can't stand to look at her he feels sick he becomes very angry he wants to leave the home but when they're apart perhaps they miss one another but as soon as they come together subhanallah Suddenly there are issues and you may find ya ikhwan that many of these issues they are interlinked with the jinn So we have to be able to distinguish between that which is jinn possession and that which is related to sihar There may be an incurable sickness which seems to have no cause Again, you will remember that I mentioned this as one of the signs of jinn possession Maybe the jinn is afflicting that individual giving him health problems giving him health problems and I've mentioned this before but I'll mention it again there was a sister who came to me and the doctors gave her just a few weeks to live just a few weeks to live because they said your heart uh, you have a heart condition and you're not going to survive you're not going to survive you have a few weeks to live when we did the ruqya subhanallah it, it you know transpired that the jinn was sitting in the sister's back and it was playing with the valves of her heart and it was starving certain areas of her heart from blood. So when the, uh, when, the, when the doctors, they did their investigations, it looked like a heart condition. But subhanAllah, this sister is now cured by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we did the ruqya and the, the ruqya was successful by the permission of Allah, the sister has no heart condition whatsoever. So there might be some, you know, some disease which subhanAllah, there is no cause, there is no real reason what's going on. The sister may not be able to conceive the sister may not be able to conceive. As a result of this, you know, subhanAllah, they go for all the tests, every little therapy that there is, but there's nothing happening. Again, we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Life and death is in the hands of Allah and everything is subject to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Turn back to Allah jalla wa'ala. 
you may find massive changes in a person's personality he may you know be one way one day and then subhanallah after this he's gone completely off deen he's gone completely off deen he wants nothing to do with islam he wants nothing to do with practicing the deen and there's no real reason why and he himself cannot put a finger on what's actually going on what's actually going on i want to mention now again ya ikhwan we could sit here and list from experiences and whatever else we could list a hundred different things but there's no point because the, the, the fact of the matter is Ya Ikhwan is do the Ruqya and take each step at a time. And this is something that you will begin to, uh, you know, to gain with experience, gauge with experience bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Every single case has its own situation. Every single case is unique but you will find these common streaks running through them husband and wife arguing for no apparent reason where there was love there is now hatred they're not able to have uh, intimate relations as husband and wife they're uh, they're not able to have children all of these things but again ya ikhwan we shouldn't be people who the first thing that we run to is magic whenever there's a problem in our life we run to magic whenever there's a problem in our life we say jinn possession we cannot do this we cannot do this okay what are some of the differences between magic and jinn possession? We need to understand that both magic and jinn possession, they both involve the jinn. Okay? And magic can also obviously be as you know involve jinn possession. So jinn possession can result as a result of the magic. But sometimes jinn possession is not just through magic. We've mentioned when a jinn will independently of itself, it will possess a person. Maybe out of love, maybe out of desire, maybe out of revenge. So in these cases, there is no sihar. There's no magic whatsoever. But the jinn is there of its own accord. But then there's other times when the jinn, it will be sent by the magician. The magician, he makes the contract as we have mentioned and as a result of this, that jinn, it is assigned to that particular individual for that particular task. So as a result of that, this sihar, when it's sihar involved, it's usually more difficult to get rid of. Because the jinn doesn't want to leave as our brother has mentioned. Because the jinn is scared, if I leave, the magician's going to kill me. If I leave, he's going to kill my family. If I leave, he's going to kill my children. If I leave, they're going to get me. Whereas, if it's just jinn possession, he came of his own accord, he will leave of his own accord, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Or, he will die. And the same thing with sihar, it seems to be stronger. Again, we mentioned, وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ They do not harm anyone except by the permission of Allah. But sihar is more difficult to, to break, especially if you can't access the, the contract, especially if you don't know where that contract is. Um, I'll pass over to our brother now, inshaAllah.